Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here and welcome to this first session, the plenary session on Ukraine. In a minute, I'm going to introduce our speakers, say so there's been a slight change because the Deputy Prime Minister, Olya Stefanishina, unfortunately can't be with us, but we have such a good substitute I'm about to introduce. Um, how can there be a lasting peace in Ukraine? I just got back from Ukraine on Tuesday evening, and I have to say, peace seems like a long way away. And as I left, there was the terrible news of a Russian missile attack on a restaurant in Kramatorsk, a restaurant in which I have eaten many times. Mm. And so have so many Ukrainians, as well as foreign journalists and so on. And 12 people were killed, including a couple of the young waiting staff, which just breaks my heart. I would have come back sooner. I was supposed to come back um, on Friday, but of course something happened in Russia over the weekend, so I stayed on. What happened? I don't think we quite know yet. But because Ukrainians have um, this wonderful dark sense of humor, there were endless memes going around about what had been happening. And I think my favorite was a picture of Prigozhin sitting there, and the caption was, we got incredibly drunk at the weekend. I can't remember a thing. Did I do something stupid? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it's like in Ukraine. You go from farce to absolute tragedy. But we do have to think of the future and whether there can be a lasting peace. Let me introduce our panel. Andriy Zagorodnik um, was the Minister of Defense. 2019-2020, um, um, when President Zelensky, in the early time of his uh, presidency, and uh, was responsible for the modernization of, uh, of the Ukrainian army at that point. Tremendously important for those um, early successes. Up on the screen here, I see Julianne Moore. We're so grateful to you, Julianne. She is the US ambassador to NATO, joining us, I presume, from Brussels. Gary Kasparov here will be familiar to many of you. Um, a young chess champion quite a while ago now, but, but now the um, head of the Human Rights, Rights Foundation concentrating on human rights in Russia. And since the Russian invasion, he has joined up with uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, an important Russian dissident, to form the Russian Action Committee. Then we have Olesya Lukjevich, who is the head of the Ukraine program at Chatham House and um, is also the deputy head of their, their Russia and Eurasia program. And at the far end, Jonathan Powell. Jonathan was chief negotiator on the um, Northern Ireland peace deal. Since then, he has concentrated, since leaving government, um, with his own organization, Intermediate, uh, which has been involved in peace deals across the world. So I think we have a pretty good panel for this discussion. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them all to speak briefly and when I say briefly, I mean briefly, um, because we have a big panel, and then we're going to have some discussion and then involve the audience. So, Andri, can I ask you for a couple of yep. opening remarks? Two to three minutes. Ooh. <laughs> yes. So, how to achieve a peace in Ukraine in three minutes? Yeah, it's, okay, you can do it, we know. <laughs> okay. Yes, our, our favorite man was that uh, Russian army was considered the second in the world, then second in Russia, uh, so sorry, second in Ukraine, and now second in Russia. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, uh, well, we, we are very straightforward in Ukraine about that. We, we, uh, we believe that uh, the lasting peace can only be achieved through, the, uh, through military victory, uh, and simply because we don't see any other constructive option. Uh, at the moment. Uh, Putin is clearly not, uh, in, uh, not intended to change his strategy, uh, which is uh, destroy Ukraine uh, as a concept, basically. Uh, he's still after that. He's still thinking that he can achieve that, either through the m uh, means of attrition or whatever else. Uh, some people say that he may be not uh, willing to back off because that would uh, destroy his position internally. Uh, for us, it, frankly, uh, it's a secondary question. The first one is that we clearly see the intention uh, we understand that this is a mortal danger for our country. Uh, we already freed half of the territory occupied since, um, actually more than half, since uh, 24th of February last year, and we're intending to do the rest. Uh, uh, with that, uh, we believe that uh, the justice needs to be uh, brought to that whole matter. 
because uh, things like Mariupol, things like what you just described about Kramatorsk and countless other atrocities cannot be unanswered. We don't want to live in the world where people consider that they can continue business as usual with those things happen, happening. So uh, we believe that, uh, yes, it should be a military victory. We need to push Russians out of our territory. As long as they are in, uh, they would be in danger not just for us, but the whole Eastern Europe and generally the whole democratic community. So we need, we need to do that. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be easy. Uh, but, uh, but again, if, and no, there's, there's no single better solution, unfortunately, to that issue. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, then there's the long-lasting peace and they're, and they're rebuilding. So we need to rebuild Ukraine. We need to build up a massive uh, substantial force in Eastern Europe that uh, relapses and basically see, uh, continuations of those aggressions are just simply becomes impossible. Uh, until the uh, Russian regime is in power, and I mean Putin himself or whoever else follows him with the same policy, uh, if, if that happens, uh, they need to understand that they are denied an opportunity to start again like that. And denial can be only done through the building a substantial capability in the region, uh, which I believe NATO is the best platform for doing this. Uh, Ukraine can be a massive asset for that uh, because we're building a strongest army, certainly in that region. Uh, and, uh, and I believe as such, Ukraine must be a member of NATO simply because it becomes an asset to NATO, not just a liability. I'm going to um, stop you there because and I, and, this and is... And that's it. That, that's that was it. it. Yep. That was pretty good, I thought, didn't you? Uh, but let, this is a very opportune moment to go to uh, the U.S. ambassador to NATO, Julianne Smith. Julianne, can I have your opening remarks? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to join this panel and um, looking forward to the questions and, and the discussion. Um, one of the questions in the agenda for this panel was, what are some of the lessons that multilateral institutions are learning? And I thought I would just take my two or three minutes and talk about how the NATO alliance is looking at what we've learned over the last 14, 15 months. First and foremost, let me just say at the top, the alliance remains united and our resolve is as strong as ever. It was strong the first day that Russia went into Ukraine and nothing has changed. And you're gonna see that on full display at the summit in about two weeks time. In terms of the lessons, our takeaways, I would just cite four very quickly. First, unity matters and unity carries an enormous amount of weight in global affairs. And while consensus at 31 can sometimes take time and occasionally be frustrating, the reality is that the weight of consensus, what this alliance is able to do, the signaling that it can conduct, the importance that it places on consensus matters and matters for what Russia is doing inside Ukraine. Having unity at the alliance across all 31 allies matters and is very powerful in terms of applying pressure on Moscow to end this war as soon as possible. Secondly, I would say contingency planning matters. The day that Russia went into Ukraine, the alliance was ready. Why was it ready? Because we had spent months planning for this moment. We knew how we were going to reinforce the eastern flank. We knew that all of us were going to support Ukraine in this moment. And we knew that we would put unprecedented pressure on Moscow to reverse course. And so contingency planning made a difference. So the morning when we got the call at three in the morning that Russia had crossed the border, we knew the steps that we were taking at that emergency NAC at 8.30 a.m. that morning. Third thing I wanted to mention is that partners matter. The NATO alliance isn't working in isolation here. The NATO alliance is working with the European Union, the United Nations, with the OSCE, and a whole collection of multilateral institutions to continue to support Ukraine in this moment and get them the support that they need. But also NATO is working with over 40 partners around the globe and working with them to first and foremost understand what's at stake, why NATO allies are supporting Ukraine, but also to understand that NATO is not directly engaged in this conflict. So we've put a heavy emphasis on our partnerships over the last year and a half, and we believe that's making a real difference. Lastly, I would just note the important role that intelligence sharing plays in all of this. You all know that the United States shared an unprecedented amount of intelligence with our allies in the run-up to the war, and since then we have maintained that op-tempo and continued to 
share intelligence with our closest allies and partners. That helps us on all the other points I made. It helps us with contingency planning. It helps us with unity. And it helps us as we talk to our partners. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Julianne. Now, I'm leaping over you, Gary, but I will be back. Um, Olesia, can I ask for your contribution? Thank you much, Lindsay. I think the uh, most important thing now is to understand that uh, the state of war in Ukraine, the war of attrition, very complicated and very serious fight is part of our own creation. It's not something that emerged as the result of just Ukraine-Russia war. I think Western alliance, multilaterals, NATO, European Union, United States have made decisions uh, in the last 17 months that resulted in this kind of outcome today. So I would like all of us to think that we have a role to play. We have, uh, we are shaping how this war will end. It's not just the two sides of this conflict. And we've published a report called How to End the War. I'm not going to recite it, but this actually takes into uh, a dangerous ideas that are being proposed from various stages, uh, op-eds, uh, discussions, both public and private, about how to end this war. And I must say some of them are really will lead us to a more dangerous situation in the world. And why? I think it will undermine really the power projection of the United States, of the free democratic world, exactly at the time when we want to prevail, when we want to build those multilaterals that the Foreign Secretary was talking about. If we fail in Ukraine, I don't think that agenda will be very successful. Second, I think, we will um, lose the opportunity, which is probably quite important both for Ukraine and for Russia, to trigger deep, and I mean deep change in Russia, to transform from the imperial state to a nation state. And honestly, even if the West gives up on Ukraine because this too, it costs us too much, uh, we, we are losing attention. Ukraine will not give up on itself. And the last opinion poll shows that 58% of Ukrainians are ready to endure these horrible difficulties that we were talking at the beginning until Ukraine wins. 58% and 87% do not want to concede any territory, and that includes Crimea. So Ukrainians will keep at it. What is for us to do, and this report puts forward, I would say, three big ideas. One is double down on supporting Ukraine. It's not enough to support at the level we are currently providing, which is 0.2% of a collective GDP of Western alliance. We are fa not facing Taliban. We are facing a major adversary that requires serious resources. Otherwise, this war will last and drag. We need to also not be afraid of Russia's defeat. I think this is something I hear personally a lot, but wouldn't this destabilize? This is a Prigozhin affair. The nukes will go rogue. I think, honestly, the danger of Russia's victory is much bigger than the uh, fear of Russian defeat. And are we choosing stable war instead of some kind of instability in Russia? Honestly, Russia will be unstable, whether we want it or not, exactly because of the nature of Putin's regime, not so much because of what we do. And finally, I think accountability is key. It's key for Ukrainians, and I hope it will be key for global community. And that is one of the multilateral tracks we need to develop. And that accountability is for destruction, half a trillion destruction that has already been there. And also, it's about war crimes, and it's about uh, crime against peace. In order to renew our rule-based order, we need to hold people accountable for what they have done in the world. Ukrainians will be pushing for it, Eastern Europeans will be pushing for it, and I hope wider world community will be pushing for it. I'll stop here. Thank you. Let me go to Jonathan before we finish with Gary. Jonathan. Lindsay, thank you very much. I think it is very difficult to be dispassionate uh, about what's happening in Ukraine, particularly in light of the at attack in Kramatorsk. In fact, a very close friend of mine, a Colombian, was in that pizza restaurant when the missiles hit. He was only slightly injured, but the Ukrainian author, a woman next to him, had part of her skull blown off. Uh, 11 people killed, three children. It's very difficult to have anything other than the emotion of revenge and wanting uh, justice in those circumstances. My job, however, day to day, is working on negotiations. This is clearly not the right time for negotiations in Ukraine. The Ukrainian offensive has only just begun. We need to see how that plays out. We need to see what happens in Russia after the events of the weekend. Uh, I rather agree with uh, President uh, 
Biden's speaking notes, which were photographed yesterday, saying it's too early to tell what's going to happen in Russia, and I think that's right, and we need to see where it goes. But we do know that this war will end in negotiations, as President Zelensky and President Biden have repeatedly said. And the reason we know that is because there's not going to be a total victory. The Ukrainians will not march on Moscow, as in the Second World War, uh, and dictate terms. So even if President Putin goes, there will need to be a negotiation. Russia will remain the large neighbor next to Ukraine. It will remain a larger military power. There has to be guarantees of non-repetition. And we need to avoid the danger of the stab in the back uh, conspiracy theory of Germany in the 1920s and 30s in Russia, which would uh, encourage a repetition of it. Um, so it is, however, I think, the time to prepare for negotiations. In fact, there's a duty to prepare for negotiations. What I see in my life is that people think that they have to prepare for political campaigns or military campaigns, but for a negotiation, you can just turn up and it will be all right. And it didn't work out so well for the Ukrainians last time with Minsk I and Minsk II, where they weren't prepared. The Russians ran rings around them in the negotiation. The problem was not the elements of the agreement. It was the sequence in which they were to take place, which the Ukrainians uh, could never actually implement. Um, and the, the Ukrainians must not lose at the negotiating table this time what they win on the battlefield. That would be a tragedy. Uh, I think an armistice of the North Korean sort that people talk about uh, would be a disaster. Uh, it would leave Ukraine in a position where Russia could continue to exercise leverage on it to prevent it developing in a European direction, to, to prevent the rebuilding. And you just have to look at North Korea and the Korean Peninsula and the, con the consideration of development of nuclear weapons by South Korea and by Japan to see this is not a stable uh, endpoint. You do not want to get into that. So in conclusion, I think it's important that the Western allies support Ukraine in preparing for negotiations and when they eventually happen in those negotiations, just as we have in the war. Uh, after all, it's the Western countries will have to deliver on lifting sanctions when they're ready to lift them and on guarantees. But in the end, this is a war in which Ukrainians are fighting and they decide when it ends and you how it ends. It, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let us now go to Gary. Oh, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, uh, I'm in a very sensitive position because though I have nearly impeccable record fighting Vladimir Putin, my first article warning about his existential danger to the free world was published in the Wall Street Journal on January 4, 2001. But I'm still Russian, and I feel this collective responsibility for the heinous crimes committed by, by my compatriots on Ukrainian soil. I still believe it's a Russia's war, not Putin's war not just shifting uh, all the uh, um, emphasis on the dictator. Uh, the battle in Ukraine is not just a, a war to restore Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's, uh, it's, it's an eternal battle between freedom and tyranny. And the outcome of this battle will be felt throughout the world, from North Korea to Venezuela, from Belarus to Zimbabwe. So we have not just uh, focus on lasting peace in Ukraine. The outcome of this war will decide the global security infrastructure. Now, uh, let me comment on, on the false narrative about negotiations. Not every war does end at a negotiating table. The wars on principle do not end at negotiating table. World War II has not ended at a negotiating table. American Civil War, thanks God, has not ended at negotiating table uh, because General Grant, supported by President Lincoln, insisted on unconditional surrender you cannot negotiate on values. Putin's goal was, is, and will be to destroy Ukrainian statehood and Ukrainian nation. There is no way to negotiate. Uh, unconditional surrender means that Ukraine must win, and I still, I'm still waiting for Western leadership to claim or to, to actually announce the goals of Ukrainian victory, which include, as we say, liberation, reparation, and justice. Full liberation of Ukrainian territory all the way down to Sevastopol, uh, reparations paid for the damages, and we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars, and war criminals brought to justice. Short of these goals, we will not have lasting peace, because that's a way to preserve integrity of the, of the uh, uh, international security order. And by the way, Ambassador, I have to comment on your misleading statement about NATO was ready. NATO was not ready to uh, support Ukraine. General Milley, Chairman of Ch Joint Chiefs of Staff, in the beginning of February, testifying on the Hill, beginning of February 2022, argued strongly against providing Ukraine with any modern weapons because the Ukrainian army, according to General Milley, would lose very quickly and this equipment will be handed to, to, over to, to Russians. I found it a bit sarcastic 
that uh, someone who was responsible for leaving American weapons worth of tens of billions of dollars in the hands of Taliban six months earlier was so uh, cautious about providing Ukraine with these weapons. The first response to Russian invasion was not to provide Ukraine with weapons, but offering President Zelensky to escape. So I believe that there were no negotiations between NATO ally, uh, uh, allies uh, how to host government in exile. And God forbid, had Putin succeeded winning, the, winning the, the first battle for Kyiv and take over Kyiv, I bet you that all NATO countries would be negotiating with Putin's puppet government in, in Kyiv. The reason NATO has changed position is because of heroic resistance of Ukrainians and outstanding leadership of President Zelensky, who responded to American kind offers saying, I don't need a right, I need an ammunition. So again, let's be honest, NATO is not united on, 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 on this war. Yes, there is a unity on front, but there's so many things uh, uh, behind the crawl scenes, and that's why the, the meeting in Vilnius in, in, in two weeks' time will not be an easy one. And the United States is still short of saying Ukraine must win. There's a still a big debate whether we would like to talk to good Putin, not necessarily Putin himself, or we want to see new Russia. And, uh, and that's why Putin believes that he can uh, bluff with escalation. This is another false narrative. Escalation, what does it mean? So it, for, the, for the fear of escalation, Ukrainians has been paying uh, in, in, in lives every day. So I, I can okay. continue on, but that's, that's, that's probably all right. enough. So we have, we have some good, fundamental, interesting disagreements here. We have a disagreement about whether NATO is united and whether and NATO's reaction to the war. In a sense, that's the present and a bit of the past and the future. Do all wars have to end in negotiation? Ukraine saying it must get back every inch of its territory and will not compromise. These are very difficult issues. Andre, I'm going to turn to you before we open to the audience. We'll discuss this a little bit because you looked at me when Jonathan was speaking and you, and you were shaking your head. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, we need to understand that uh, if we're going to discuss the post-war period, we will not be able to discuss this with Putin's government. Putin's government is not capable of any constructive, constructive solutions, and they cross so many lines in uh, terms of atrocities and war crimes that they uh, are not a proper party to be uh, in, in discussions with. Also, they dragged, our, uh, dragged us for years and years in so-called means process, and that means process, and that's where I was shaking head. I mean, uh, the, the key reason for the means process, not because it wasn't prepared, the, the key problem was means process was because Russia, Russia didn't want to find a peaceful solution. They didn't want to find any compromises and so on. I worked for President Zelensky from the beginning of his, uh, his tenure as a president, and I can tell you that he was absolutely sincerely wanted to find uh, the solution. He went to the means process, and many people in Ukraine criticized him for that, because many people already passed through the war. They already realized who Putin was. But he, he actually said, we need to give the peace a chance, and he wanted to do that for, for, for as long as, uh, until, until we realized, well, I mean, his, his cabinet realized that uh, Putin was just like walking around with the circles, clearly just dragging time, and uh, at the same time trying to destroy the country from within. And, and when he realized this is not going to be possible, he started the full-scale invasion. The reason, and, and one more thing, the reason about unity of, uh, the, 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 the notion about unity of NATO and so on. Uh, of course, there's been a massive miscalculation of Russian power <coughs> and Ukrainian power and a net, uh, net uh, balance of, this, of these powers. Uh, indeed, like most, like 90% of analytical community in the world did not understand how this war will turn out. And that's true. And that's why the politicians, they were making certain plans. Right now, we're enjoying unprecedented support from NATO countries, uh, lead, lead, led by the United States as a major sponsor, and as United Kingdom and, and other countries. Some countries changed completely their policy to Ukraine, like Germany, for example, who were originally saying that, yeah, we need to find the way out of this and then have business as usual. And then they realized that Putin crossed those lines. And I can tell you, if, if to convince German politicians that uh, the peaceful solution is not a solution anymore, it takes something. I, I, and it's not that easy. And they even realize that because they understand now that certain lines cannot be uncrossed. And Putin, uh, Putin crossed those lines. So now we have to go for the victory. And I understand that, yeah, we're not planning to march in Moscow, at least for the, at, at the moment. I mean, I'm, I'm, oh, at least at I'm the sure. Moment. I like that. I'm sure, I'm sure there will be a peaceful, uh, sorry, there will be a democratic coalition marching in Moscow together with, with democratic Russians one day. Because uh, Russian regime, as it is right now, will go away. He has no chance to stand. 
Uh, but we, what we need to do, we need to free our territory, and that would be for us a massive, uh, a massive achievement, and that's where we're going. We're absolutely not going to compromise on that, because okay. any compromise will mean that there will be a continuation of the war. Okay. That's Let me, very uh, I would like to turn to Ambassador Smith, because I, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to, to um, Gary Kasparov about the, the readiness of NATO, but also two other things. One is this every inch of Ukrainian territory back, no compromise. And the other is you, you talked about unity, and yet China, India, many African countries, we, we, we're not seeing a, a global unity on the, the war in Ukraine, quite, quite the opposite, aren't we? Thank you. Uh, well, what I can tell you and what I live each and every day here at NATO headquarters is that the alliance is united. There are not cracks. I don't see any cracks in alliance unity in allies' support for Ukraine. And the previous speaker was 100% right. We've seen unprecedented changes in national policies, policies here inside the NATO alliance to ensure that those Ukrainian military forces have everything they need to succeed on the battlefield. And in terms of what happened on the morning of February 24th, we did take action. We activated the graduated response plans. We activated elements of the NATO response force. Allies immediately moved forces into Central and Eastern Europe and individually allies immediately began supporting the Ukrainian government with economic, humanitarian and security assistance. So I see nothing but action. I would also add not a NATO competency, but what the EU did working with the United States and other countries on the unprecedented sanctions that were put in place that same day to me signals an enormous amount of contingency planning and we were ready. We were ready when we got the call at 3 a.m. that morning. So we do have different perspectives there. In terms of the messages and that are coming out and the disinformation that exists globally, yes, you are correct that the PRC and Russia are doing their very best to put out a counter narrative, somehow stressing that this is the responsibility of the NATO alliance, which is preposterous. This is about Russia invading a sovereign country and jeopardizing the principles of the UN or violating the principles of the UN Charter. So we will have to continue to work to get out the truth and counter the level of disinformation that Russia and China are putting out together to the global south and many other corners of the world about the realities or their perceived realities of what's happening on the ground inside Ukraine. But I do think that allies take this challenge very seriously. We have worked tirelessly to get the truth out and to counter what Russia and China are trying to relay to the rest of the world in terms of this somehow being NATO's responsibility. Just say, to make a contribution. I want to bring us back to understanding that we've achieved a lot, both on Ukrainians on the battlefield and the uh, alliance. It, it, of course, Ukraine wouldn't be able to be as successful as it is, reclaiming 50% of territory and now crossing Dnipro River and mounting serious counteroffensive. I think, but we also should not settle in complacency that we have done enough. We have obstructed plan A of President Putin, and he speaks truth. It was a special operation. He was not preparing for a total war, mm -hmm. but now he will be preparing and is preparing for a total war. It's not time to pat each other on the shoulder and be satisfied. This is our key message from this, and, and I think that we should also understand that this is not just the war against Ukraine. In 2007, Putin said it all. You written it in 2001. He declared a, a war on global order, on, uh, in, in various ways he is corroding, destroying through Wagner groups, through other groups from Africa, Latin America. It's not just about Ukraine. Ukraine is the front line, the most visible battle right now. And, and that's why I think this global conference of Chatham House has to understand this. We all have role to play. And as Dante said, you know, the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who at the time of moral crisis preserve neutrality. We cannot be neutral now, I otherwise the whole the world will burn. I don't think anybody's talking about neutrality. What we're talking about is how this war comes to an end. Yeah. So, Gary Kasparov, one of the issues is that, you know, if we had a, a representative of the Ukrainian government here, 
Um, she or he would not sit on the same stage as you because you are a Russian. Um, and that's a very clear thing. I mean, Andre here is not a representative of the government. What do you feel or think about that? Is that reasonable or is that something which will get in the way of any kind of partnership to try and bring this to an end? Um, there are Russians and Russians. So I, exactly, I, but the Ukrainian I, my government organization that does I not chair say in America that. raised over $11 million helping Ukraine. And I raised many millions on my own as an individual because, yes. again, I believe in my responsibility and, and, and I believe that it's, 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 it's my duty to, to help but Ukraine I'm, to win I'm the sorry, war. that is the point I'm making, that the Ukrainian government does not distinguish between Russians yeah. like you who have done that. And no, it does. It does. Okay, okay. that's this. Uh, uh, yeah. But okay, let's 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 you know, it, let's let's not you know just move away from from this is it's just important points. Uh, mm. Again, this is this. I heard about NATO unity. I missed this 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 morning newspapers. Uh, is Hungary still member of the alliance? Uh, if it's if it, if it's yes, if it's not is it not being expelled last night. So you have to read the statements of uh, of Prime Minister Orban, mm -hmm. openly. Oh, we're talking about disinformation. Repeated Russian lies about everything, including the beginning of the war. Turkey position, uh, I don't know, can we call it unity? No, of course, you know, most of the NATO countries, they, they, uh, they, uh, they are united because they have to fight Russian aggression. But there's a fundamental uh, uh, difference in the view of uh, conducting the war and the outcome of the war between Poles, Baltic nations, Finns, and uh, the United States. Again, it's, 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 I, I understand the difference between saying we will stand with Ukraine as long as it takes and Ukraine must win. Yeah. So, it's, it's, again, I see no other way to end this war but a full liberation of Ukrainian territory. Any negotiation, and by the way, I don't understand, how are you going to negotiate you know, with Ukrainian territories? Negotiate with Northern Ireland. That's your territory. How can you talk about negotiating at the expense of others? It's not just you know, square kilometers. It's people who live there. And who is going to be responsible for the worst crimes that we've seen since World War II? And it's not just the worst crimes. It's the first time we're watching genocide online. It's not that they're committing these crimes. They're bragging about these crimes every day. So it's, it's, if we believe it can go unpunished, and these people, oh, they're still our potential partners at the negotiating table, I think the whole idea of the global security is bust. Um, I, you but know can, can, so I want to go to, yeah. to Jonathan before I open it up. Jonathan, the, the, the panel is lining up against you, I feel. I there want to you step are, in. I, I, saying now is not the time for negotiation, <laughs> but there will be negotiation in the end. And everybody else is saying, Ukraine must win every inch of territory back, no negotiation, this is the line. Well, I, I totally understand the emotion and feel it myself it's in terms of emotion. Ukraine. Well, if you let me Sorry. speak, I'm not, not suggesting that uh, we should negotiate for Ukraine. That's the last thing I'm suggesting. In fact, I'm suggesting it shouldn't be for us or Russians or anyone else to negotiate for Ukraine. They should negotiate. I did work in uh, Ukraine <clears throat> when President Poroshenko was in office, and the problem with the Minsk agreement, as I said, was not uh, the elements in it. It was the sequence that the Ukrainian government allowed itself to be pushed into by the French and German governments. And Andrei is absolutely right. President Zelensky was clear from the beginning that what he wanted was peace. He tried everything to get to peace, but the Russians were not playing. They had trapped the Ukrainians with this sequence, and they wouldn't let them out of it. That was the problem. And that's why preparation is important and resisting when you're being pushed into it. Secondly, uh, for Gary's point, I did say at the beginning, this is not the Second World War. We are not the Ukrainians, not we. The Ukrainians are not going to march on Moscow, uh, nor should we ask them to. Uh, and if you don't occupy the capital, if you don't have Sherman's march, you don't get to dictate the terms. Uh, you have to negotiate. Even if Putin goes, we'll have to negotiate justice, as Gary says. We have to negotiate reparations. We have to, when I say we, Ukraine has to negotiate mm. these things. And most of all, a non-repetition. Uh, I think it is unreasonable to ask the Ukrainians to fight until Putin uh, goes. I can see why Gary wants Putin to go. Many people would like Putin to go. But it's up to the Ukrainians to decide what they're fighting for. If they want to continue the war, even when they regain their territory until Putin is gone, that is a decision for Ukrainians. But this war will end in a negotiation, uh, I believe. In fact, all wars have, and that's what President Biden <coughs> and President Zelensky have said. This is not the time for negotiation. This is a time to support Ukraine militarily, to get them to get their territory back, but we have to think ahead, and if we don't think ahead, we will pay a price later. 
Okay, I'm going to open it out for questions. Oh, yep, they're all going out. They're all <laughs> blokes. Oh, come on. <laughs> Ladies, wake up. Yes, uh, the question uh, there, yeah. Thank you very much. Emmanuel Aguilar, International Law Programme at Chatham House. A very specific question to you, Jonathan. You just mentioned uh, guarantees of non-repetition, and I'm just wondering what those would look like in a negotiation. Well, they will relate. Sorry, should I, yeah, go yeah, ahead. They, they will. They will relate, obviously, to what sort of guarantees uh, Ukraine can have uh, of its security, as well as undertakings that uh, a Russian government itself uh, gives, both to respecting the borders, but also to uh, the measures that will be taken to, for example, return to the CFE, the Conventional Forces Agreements in Europe. Uh, of the 1990s, which specified where you could put your conventional forces. You couldn't put them all on the border uh, as happened last time. You would be subject to inspection in those cases. It would be, what is uh, Ukraine going to join NATO? Uh, what other kind of guarantees can be given? Can Ukraine be turned into a hedgehog that arms it sufficiently with, with planes and everything else and training, including training on its territory, to ensure the Russians to. never think of trying this again. Those are the measures you need to think about if you're going to ensure non-repetition. Um, you wanted to uh, come in on that, Andrew? Yes, we, we, are, we are a little bit in a dangerous spot here. Let's not mix two, several things together. So one thing is that, yes, there are statistically talks at the end of every war. And no, it's absolutely not the case that this war will end with negotiations with Putin's regime. Because, because there's many regimes we, uh, where an, war ended without any negotiations with them. Nobody negotiated with Saddam Hussein. Uh, Milosevic didn't die at negotiating table. Uh, Hitler didn't die at negotiating table, and so on and so on. All those, there's many type, uh, times when the, when the war do, do end with some people sitting down and discussing the future order, but the, actually the, the, the aggressor is not present at that table. So that's what's going to happen here. Putin is not able for any constructive discussions, and more importantly, he doesn't honor any single agreement he did in his life. Yes. So that's why, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I don't want to but repeat can, myself, can but I, that's but, a very... But can I yeah. come in on this? Because I understand about the weakness of the Russian army, which we have seen, but there is also a practical issue of a, of a country of 48 million and a country of 148 million. And the general, what the military people call mass. Is it actually possible for Ukraine to win militarily? Because, of course, I understand how brilliantly the Ukrainians did at the beginning, but at the moment, we're talking about four lines of defense yes. which the counteroffensive is, is facing. Is it possible? It is possible, but uh, uh, we're already doing this. And we're already slowly, but we're free, freeing our country. Yes, it's physically, militarily, operationally, it's absolutely possible. Should have no doubt about that. Alessa. I think Ukraine has a tremendous advantage and can win this war. Why I think so? First of all, there's a, an interesting project called Correlations of War that studies war historically, right? And they say that basically the first party to start the war usually loses. If you don't win it really fast, you usually lose. And Ukraine is fighting on its own territory. It knows the terrain. Ukraine has a strategy that I think outsmarts Russia. And Ukraine, thanks to NATO's assistance and NATO member states' assistance, will and already has some technological advantage. Not everywhere, especially in the air, airspace it doesn't have. But some um, areas, Russia is already drafting uh, handbooks how to fight a technologically superior enemy. They are thinking about Ukraine. So all of this and the morale of the society and some of those numbers I gave, I think Ukraine can will. And I would like just to um, come back to the security arrangement and a hedgehog and sometimes people say Israel. I don't want Ukraine to be Israel. I want Ukraine to be part of a multilateral collective security because this is Europe. We all yes. hear in it together. If we really want to succeed, it will be cheaper for all of us. It will be actually much better for coordinating strategy vis-a-vis -vis Eurasia, if you want to call it, and what will be happening on that geographical space. We, you know, we, we will be seeing a lot of shifting moves and to put the tectonic moves in Eurasia, and having Ukraine as part of the collective security, I think will be an advantage. Okay, let me open up more questions. There's a gentleman at the front here, and um, there's a microphone will come. Thank you very much. It is the ambassador of Lithuania, so probably naturally will be to say that the uh, Lithuanian government fully allies with the position that this end of this war is the Ukrainian victory against Russia. But my question goes with the Vilnius summit 
and the Ukrainian membership aspiration. So any of you, especially yeah. Andre, if you say a few words, what would be Ukrainian wish of NATO formulas in Vilnius on membership requests? Okay, and actually, can I add on that, yeah. um, which is that NATO, EU as well, and then I would put that also to, uh, to Ambassador Smith after you. Well, in an ideal world, of course, we would be happy that uh, we have a discussion on, very particular, on a membership with a very particular date. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to say whether this is going to happen. There's currently being decided like what sort of formulation NATO countries will come up with. I sincerely hope that they would be very much more specific than, uh, than, than something we have seen because uh, we already had lots of uh, you know, statements and promises and assurances and so on. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me tell you when Ukraine becomes part of NATO, uh, actually like a member of NATO. It will happen, I unfortunately can't give you a date at the moment, but, but, uh, but I can tell you what's going to precede that. The understanding that Ukraine is an asset for NATO and is absolutely a replaceable asset for NATO. A common understanding among the NATO allies. That's what, that will shift the, the situation, because right now many countries consider Ukraine as a liability. Ukraine as a, as a place where investment will go and it's completely endless sort of a, a flow of investments into. As soon as they understand that uh, lessons from the war and one of the lessons which you absolutely rightly said about the mass matters, we need a massive presence of troops in, a, in an absolute state of readiness, in immediate state of readiness in Eastern Europe in order to be able to deny Russia an ability to harass Eastern European security. As soon as we realize that, as soon as we realize that we need lots of weapons, we need lots of people absolutely ready. So there won't be a time to ship equipment from Australia. We, we're doing this right now. I mean, we're grateful to Australians, but it takes too long. Uh, uh, we still do this. Uh, there, there, there will not be time to ship equipment and people from the United States because, because Russians can move in a matter of days and, 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 and occupy vast territories. So we, we're building right now an army which can protect the whole Eastern Europe. As soon as the NATO alliance will understand that and will want to use that opportunity, there will be serious discussions about Ukraine. Let, let me put that to Ambassador Smith. Um, Ambassador Smith, the, uh, the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO, how do you see that working out? Do you see a timeline? Do you see any kind of interim um, measure? How, how is it looking? Well, as you might imagine, the Alliance has been discussing this for months now and in close consultations with our friends in Ukraine. We've had a couple of high-level meetings. We had a recent meeting in Oslo where we were able to convene foreign ministers. We just had defense ministers here. In essence, we're working right now. We've got about two weeks to go to put together a package for our friends in Ukraine that will move beyond restating what we saw in 2008. Obviously, the Bucharest language still stands, so that's not going anywhere. We're not getting rid of the Bucharest de Declaration. But I think the Ukrainians will see that the alliance will have a fresh package of deliverables that will be a mix of long-term practical support in terms of helping them with their longer term modernization, irrespective of what's happening with the current war, we'll be putting together, in addition, uh, a whole package of political deliverables as well that will showcase an enhanced relationship between the alliance and Ukraine. And lastly, in the communique, we'll be referencing NATO's interest in talking to Ukraine about its aspirations. And what exactly that language will say and how it says it is something we're literally working working on in real time. But I will say we've traveled some distance in recent months, and I'm confident that when President Zelensky comes to the summit in person, he will be pleased with the package of deliverables that NATO will have for him at the summit. Um, and I suppose one of the other important things, is, I'm, I'm, actually I have a question to you, Gary. One of the other important things is that, of course, this is exactly the opposite of what President Putin said he wanted when he started ah. this war. Yes, Gary, you wanted to say yeah, something? Um, I think when we talk about Ukrainian membership in NATO, I think sometimes we forget what NATO was for. In 1949, this organization was built by Americans to do what? To, pr to defend free Europe from Soviet Russian invasion. At that time, the defense line was east of River Rhine. Mm. Now, the geography has changed. Uh, this, this line is east of River Dnieper. But the principle is still the same. NATO was not built to fight war in Iraq or terrorists in Afghanistan. Ukraine is fighting the only war NATO was built for. Hmm. So that's why the whole idea of is Ukraine member of NATO or not, I mean, for me, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It is a member of NATO now because it's fighting the very war NATO was created for. 
and all the uh, um, uh, outcries about supplying Ukraine was the, with, with the weapons because there's a shortage of these weapons in NATO countries. Why do we sit on these weapons? What, are you, what is America need, does America need these weapons to defend against Mexico or Canada? So, or what's happening in Europe? What are the other threats but Russia? So Ukraine has been doing a tremendous job by depleting the military forces of main threat, existential threat to global stability. I mean, tell U.S. presidents, all U.S. presidents or generals, that for 4% of U.S. military budget, mm -hmm. they could deplete 50% of Russian military capacity mm -hmm. without a single loss of American life. I think it's a good bargain. Can I come to you? Because I have a question here, um, Gary Kasparov, from Andres Muller, uh, an online question from King's College London. And his question is, does Gary Kasparov believe the war in Ukraine is the mid-game or the end-game for Russia and for President Putin? No. Uh, I think it's Putin is, is going downhill now, and, uh, uh, and the war in Ukraine will uh, end up him and his regime as it happened in Russian, in Russian history before. Any lost war, geopolitical disaster, always led to revolt and revolutions in Russia. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe, and it's, this belief is shared by my friends, that's, we have a motto of our organization, Victory for Ukraine, Freedom for Russia, that the Ukrainian flag raised in Sevastopol is the beginning of liberation of Russia from Putin's fascism. I don't know about the scenarios of the collapse of, of Putin's regime, but you know, imagine that 5,000 Prigozhin troops could have taken Moscow in, 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 a, in a day or so. Imagine that after Ukrainian victory, you have a quarter of a million of angry Russian men crossing the border going eastward. I, I'm not here, by the way, calling for Ukrainians to win the war and march to Moscow. I never said that. So it, to re removing Putin and building, okay, democracy, hopefully, in Russia, it's, 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 it's business for Russians. But again, nothing will happen in Russia before Ukraine wins. So that's why for us, it's a top priority now, making sure Ukraine wins, wins decisively, and, 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 and Putin regime will be held responsible. For but that's really interesting because I think that there's a, there's a policy of wishful thinking in Western capitals, which is rather hoping that the Russian regime crumbles because of the war rather than there being an outright, an outright victory. Jonathan, how do you interpret what, what the actual policy is in Western capitals? Because sometimes to me, I mean, the Ukrainian policy is clear, regain every inch of our territory. The Western policy is sometimes a little fuzzy. Uh, it, it is fuzzy because they don't know how things are going to develop. They're watching the offensive and seeing how that's going to play out. They saw what happened in the weekend uh, in uh, Russia and they don't know how that's going to work out. So they're keeping their options open. And anyway, it's not up to them to decide. It's up to the Ukrainians to decide how this works. Yeah, but it's up to them works. to have a policy. Yeah. But, but, but just on the point about Putin, it, uh, Gary is quite right to refer to 1917. To 1905 didn't change the Tsar, but it did change the regime. The Crimean War didn't actually lead to a change. But anyway, there are certainly examples of that. There are examples elsewhere that because Milosevic lost in Kosovo, that's why he was replaced. It wasn't during the war, it was after the war was over and he'd lost it. People stormed uh, the palace and took him out. Uh, the same with Galtieri in, in Argentina. So it does happen. The trouble is you can't count on it. Western governments can't count on Putin changing and they may have to find themselves living with Putin in place for a very, very long time. That is not desirable for Western governments, but that's what they have to be prepared for, as well as the desirable outcome that Gary is wishing for, that he goes as a result of this war. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I okay, I then, I need to, then I need to open it yeah. up to I, I all these good people. I think what is critical is how we in the West, in policy-making circles, read and what kind of conclusions we make from events that we yes. observe. And what we observed this weekend in Russia, you can make two conclusions. Oh, my God, this is too scary. We need to stabilize the regime. Or we can say Russia showed vulnerability and actually Putin backs off to power and actually now is an opportunity to provide Ukraine long-range missiles. So to a degree I agree that we don't know how it develops, but what, what, uh, what are the consequences of, of uh, evolution and yeah. steps we make matters a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm a very nice person, so I'm letting Andre talk very yeah, briefly uh, before I go to another yes, question. Just one <laughs> sentence. The West should not be afraid of victory of Ukraine. I mean, seriously, we see sense. this all the time. There's some kind of timidness. There's some kind of apprehension. Guys, come on. Uh, when Churchill announced that uh, he's going to win in the Second World War, he had much less chances than we do right now. 
And still he, he, he set a, victor poli a victory policy and went through this. We need to be resolved. Let's be resolved together. Let's not be afraid of our own victory. Thank you. Okay, that's, um, let, uh, some questions from that far end. There's a, I can see a blue sleeve and I can see who, yes, is <laughs> waving. Oh, very good. Thank you. Maria Zolkina, research fellow at the London School of Economics and head of regional security at Ukrainian Think Tank Democratic Initiatives Foundation. First, a comment to um, Jonathan. Um, the problem with Minsk agreements was not about the sequence, but basically because almost everything was uh, tried and tested, including disengagement of forces, ceasefire, uh, um, access for humanitarian organizations, yeah. and everything failed, according not to Ukraine, but to SMMOEC, which worked on a daily uh, basis on the ground and proved that Russia didn't fulfill any of even minor commitments. So we have no hopes okay, about another agreement. Okay, I say the question. Uh, my question is about the role of China, which is trying now to interfere the process of shaping post-war security architecture in Europe. And unfortunately, at least for me, uh, as an expert, um, there are mm. some countries in Europe, namely France and Germany, who are still trying to talk with China about their possible leverage on Russia, maybe in response of some other economic cooperation okay, with Russia. Okay, I'm What's the role of Russia? I'm going to um, put that question to Ambassador Smith as a representative of the US government, which is obviously, you know, has its own policy on, on China, quite apart from the, the policy on this. How, how do you see China's role in this? And uh, what do you think Western governments should be doing about China's role in this conflict? Well, we've been having, uh, over the last couple of years, a number of conversations about the PRC here inside the NATO alliance, and that's why last year, for the very first time in NATO's history, the strategic concept actually includes mention of the China challenge, in part because of its practices uh, and what it does in and around the Euro-Atlantic area and uh, across the Asia-Pacific. But more specifically in the strategic concept, we mentioned the relationship, this no-limits partnership between the PRC and Russia. We've talked a lot about the PRC's political support for what Russia is doing, its role in delivering Russian messages, and we've warned them in very clear terms about the dangers and risks of getting directly involved in providing some sort of material support to the Russians as they conduct this war inside Ukraine. So this is a part of the NATO discussion today at NATO HQ, very different from just a few days ago, but we spend quite a bit of time talking about and focused on this relationship, this deepening and evolving relationship between the PRC and, and Russia. Thank you. I Gary Gasparov. Comment. I think that's, the, that's not exactly the situation the way I see it. Uh, China offers literally no assistance to Russia for a very simple reason. Uh, Xi Jinping, of course, expected Putin to win quickly, and God forbid Putin take over Kiev in four days, he probably be preparing for attacking Taiwan. But Putin lost. It's unwinnable war. And the way that PRC now, now Xi Jinping is acting is they waiting for the outcome. And the main reason why the United States is afraid of Ukrainian outright victory is because they are afraid of the collapse of Russia. Consequently, that by the way, no, have the, no, no one among serious politicians have, have doubts about uh, a collapse of Russia after Ukrainian victory, and Chinese rise. How many of you are aware about Chinese territorial claims to Russia? Official claims. 1.5 million square kilometers. All Russian territories from Vladivostok to, to Lake Baikal. By the way, on Chinese maps, there's no more Vladivostok. It's Hanshan Li. And these territories are just as resulted from, from uh, the forced treaty by Russian Empire on China in 1860, and China believes it was illegally annexed. So Xi Jinping might be very happy with Putin losing the war because collapse of Russia would offer him much better opportunity to gain a, a piece of real estate better than the Rocky Island uh, uh, east, east, east of China. Again, it's a complicated game. But again, let's not shift, you know, this is responsibility to China. Let's, you know, say Ukraine must win and let's not worry about the consequences of Ukrainian victory for my country. Uh, Ambassador Smith, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I just, I, I sense that there's some uh, confusion, uh, maybe is the best way to describe it, about the U.S. role here as it relates to what Russia is doing inside Ukraine. And I'd just like to kind of revisit uh, the facts 
in terms of the $40 billion that the United States has already provided to Ukraine in direct security assistance, and a lot more in terms of economic and humanitarian assistance. I would note that the U.S. is the one leading the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, or often referred to as the Ramstein Group, meeting monthly with Ukrainian military commanders to assess what their direct needs are and addressing those needs by convening over 50 countries around the world to ensure that Ukrainians are getting the assistance in real time that they need to prevail on the battlefield. Lastly, I would say at the highest levels, the U.S. government and the Biden administration, including President Biden himself, has engaged multiple leaders around the world, whether it's in Latin America, the Asia Pacific or Africa, to make sure that Ukrainian story is told, that countries understand what's fundamentally at stake. This is not just about Ukraine defending its territory. This is about Ukraine defending the values that we hold deal, dear and upholding the principles of the U.N. Charter. So just to review the bidding here in terms of the leadership role that the United States is providing providing the assistance that we will continue providing and make sure that there's no misunderstanding about President Biden's commitment and America's commitment to supporting Ukraine in this moment. Thank you very much, Ambassador Smith. Now, I'm afraid we are out of time. So I've been asked to sum up the discussion in three sentences. Oh, God. So that's quite difficult. But what I would say is that there is there are basically two poles of opinion, aren't there? One is that the only option is Ukrainian victory, complete Ukrainian victory, which means recovering all of Ukrainian territory, reparations, and the collapse of the Putin regime in Russia. I think there's another point of view, which is that you cannot count on that. So you have to prepare for some kind of negotiation and compromise, however distasteful that might be. I think there's another point of contention, which is about the level of Western support for Ukraine, how much is required, and whether the West has, been, has just been sort of led bit by bit by bit into providing more and more because of Ukrainian um, success, and whether the West should now get ahead and be providing those F-16s and those longer range missiles and so on in order to achieve that victory. But in some ways, I think the most interesting thing was what you just said, which was, and I will, you phrased it as a statement, and I will phrase it as a question. Is the West afraid of Ukrainian victory? That, I think, is the very interesting question which we should leave with. As I thank, no, you can't say anything more. It's my job to finish. I'm the chairperson. Thank you all very much indeed for your comments, and thank you to the audience.